This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up, everybody? Michael here to talk about the world's leading advocate against amphibians' sexual agency. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Alexander Emmerick Jones. There have been better times to be Mr. Jones's wallet. Actually, has there ever been a good time to be inside the pants of Alec Jones regularly? I don't think so. Last month, he was ordered to pay over $49 million in a defamation lawsuit brought by the parents of the children killed in the Sandy Hook massacre. Indeed, thanks largely to Jones' influence, a staggering one in five Americans thinks Sandy Hook was staged. But even if you aren't among the nearly 20% of Americans convinced that grieving parents are actually well-paid actors, chances are you've stumbled upon your fair share of misinformation on the internet. This leaves us wondering, why is contemporary discourse so filled with misinformation? What's more, are these falsehoods threatening the very fabric of our society? And do shared societal truths even exist anymore? Let's investigate in this wisecrack edition, is misinformation here to stay? So what is misinformation anyway? Well, as defined by the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, it's the sharing of inaccurate and misleading information in an unintentional way. It's often accompanied by its more villainous sibling, disinformation, which is misinformation spread with the intention to deceive, typically to further political goals. Now, mis and disinformation have been around since the first Neanderthal took false credit for inventing fire. But misinformation needs widespread mediums of communication to really spread. Take ancient Rome where coins were basically the first mass-produced methods of communication, regularly used to project rulers' power and convey state propaganda. It didn't take long for Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, to use engraved coins to spread disinformation about his rival, Mark Antony, calling him, among other things, a raging alcoholic and a traitor for marrying Cleopatra. Skip ahead to the invention of the printing press, which significantly lowered the barrier to circulate your ideas. There were political ramifications to this, like when rebels trying to take down England's King George II filled papers with fake stories claiming that he was ill. King George ultimately prevailed, but the rebels kickstarted a solid game of political health shaming that, unlike King George, remains alive and well today. As for America, it's been awash with misinformation since the colonial days, when posters and pamphlets propagated biased, politicized news. Benjamin Franklin himself amplified revolutionary fervor by penning propaganda stories about indigenous Americans colluding with King George III. I don't know much for sure, but I know that if your name is King George, people probably hate you. When American newspapers emerged in the early 1800s, they balanced hard news with straight up fake stories, like the Great Moon Hoax, in which the New York Sun claimed there was an alien colony on the moon. By the 1890s, what we now call yellow journalism erupted as newspaper magnates Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst battled in a circulation war, using misleading and fantastical headlines to sell papers. Think of it as um, early clickbait, except they weren't clicking, they were, they were grabbing papers, so we'll call it grab bait. The influence of yellow journalism is often cited as one of the driving forces of the Spanish-American War. So yes, some guys that own newspapers helped start a war. Sounds, sounds fun. Unsurprisingly, this is around when the term fake news seems to have entered the lexicon. If it sounds like early America was awash in bullshit news, it's because it totally was. But as philosopher Jacob Saul writes, yellow journalism had a backlash effect as people sought out more objective or reputable news. Newspapers started hiring better educated reporters and journalists to cover fact-based news about business and the economy for the wealthy investor class. Papers started relying on the subscription model, which further disincentivized disinformation because customers could simply switch to a competitor's paper if they felt they were being duped. So again, the free market fixes everything. All of this created an entirely novel media climate. As historian Jonathan Ladd writes, the existence of an independent, powerful, widely respected news media establishment is an historical anomaly. Prior to the 20th century, such an institution had never existed in American history. The government also played a big role in this. By 1937, a Roper poll asking, is the press fair, showed that 66% of Americans said yes. Continuing this trend, in 1949, after television entered the picture, the Federal Communications Commission sought to preserve objective news with the Fairness Doctrine, which required broadcast news to present balanced coverage and to supplement controversial opinions with counterpoints. When the policy was axed by Ronald Reagan's FCC in 1987, 
everything changed. Wow, Ronald Reagan ruined something in the 80s. This is crazy. According to the Washington Post, almost overnight, the media landscape was transformed. Opinionated news, including talk radio shows like Rush Limbaugh's, exploded on the scene. This is also a benevolent dictatorship. I am the dictator. There is no First Amendment here except for me. We have one responsibility, and that is to have the listeners of this show enjoy it and be entertained and drawn to it and want to stay. At the same time, newsrooms shrank and the 24-hour news cycle emerged. The need to produce greater quantities of news at a faster pace, according to scholar David A. Logan, incentivized journalists to get the news first and fast rather than first and right. Misinformation, unsurprisingly, followed. For example, in 1985, the Soviet Union started a rumor that AIDS had been created in a U.S. military laboratory. This spread like wildfire, and by 1987, reporter Dan Rather repeated the accusations on CBS without asking the government for a response. By the time the internet rolled around, all bets were off. If the printing press lowered the barrier to spread information, the internet obliterated it. But the digital web of misinformation was far less mainstream. As scholar Dave Karp writes, conspiratorial websites in the mid-1990s also had a sharply limited audience. This was the pre-Google internet, where search was time-consuming and difficult. If you wanted to find information about all manner of Clinton conspiracies in 1997, you would have had to look pretty hard. That was about to change thanks to a little thing formerly known as the Facebook. Drop the the, just Facebook. But before we get into it, I want to talk to you about this video sponsor, Keeps. Now, you might have heard the alarming statistic that two out of three men will experience male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. And while that's totally wild, you don't need to worry because you got Keeps. Now, Keeps is a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable to prevent hair loss. You start with a free consultation with a licensed Keeps doctor who will help you get the right combination of FDA approved prescriptions and over the counter medications. And you'll never have to worry about running out of your Keeps products thanks to an automatic refill that arrives at your door every three months. Now, if you have any questions or if you wanna share progress updates, you can message your Keeps doctor 24 seven. Results appear within four to 12 months, so get started today day to hang on to the hair you have. Join the hundreds of thousands of men who've tried Keeps and given it more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now back to the show. While there's a long history of misinformation in America, things are definitely different today. Its reach has been exacerbated by changes in how the internet and especially social media spread information. Some of this has to do with the way traditional news pivoted online, where the metric of the page view was king. In the years since, things like social media shares and engagement have become another important way of measuring digital success. As data scientist Noah Gian Siracusa writes, Contemporary page view driven news is the regrettable 19th century yellow press on digital steroids. With competition for attention more intense than ever and advertising revenue and subscription numbers down, even legacy media outlets have started relying more on heavily charged emotions and extreme opinions. This is exemplified by someone like Tucker Carlson, who fended off a slander lawsuit in 2020 when a judge ruled that viewers should already know that he's not stating actual facts and is presenting non-literal commentary. M&Ms will not be satisfied until every last cartoon character is deeply unappealing and totally androgynous. Until the moment you wouldn't want to have a drink with any one of them. That's the goal. When you're totally turned off, we've achieved equity. They've won. You and me both, Tucker. This shift has also changed the way we view the obligations of reporters. As scholar Norman Fairclaw explains, in addition to the knowledgeable reporter informing the interested citizen, there is an element of the media artist entertaining the viewer as consumer. Across mediums, this has led to the rise of infotainment, or news presented with all the trappings of conventional entertainment formats, or entertainment presented with all the trappings of the news format. I'm here at the Pentagon to find out what Space Force, the sixth and coolest branch of the US military does. I'm talking spaceships, lasers, it's the military in space. <laughs> it's worth noting that news hasn't always been about the hustle to make money. Mark Gunther notes that as recently as the late 1970s, there was no network news business. The big three broadcast television networks all covered news, but none generally made money doing so. 
nor did they expect to turn a profit from news programming. In contrast, as scholar Jason Harson notes, internet news rapidly became a money-making venture, writing, the digital communication infrastructure is not designed to suit democratic political communication or trustworthy information, but rather to suit recent forms of consumer capitalism, the attention economy. As we've become habituated to perpetually shocking headlines, disinformation has flourished. Karp says, to state it plainly, fake news in the 1990s was a hobby. Today, it is an industry. For that matter, it's an industry worth nearly a quarter billion dollars in online ad revenue annually as of 2019. Almost 40% of that revenue came from Google. Algorithmically primed to boost content that incites our most extreme emotions, social media has been crucial to the spread of misinformation. We talked about this in a recent video, but it's worth repeating. Controversial ideas equate to virality on social media. As journalists Stuart A. Thompson and Charlie Warzel write, Facebook's algorithms have coaxed many people into sharing more extreme views on the platform, rewarding them with likes and shares for posts on subjects like election fraud conspiracies, COVID-19 denialism, and anti-vaccination rhetoric. In recent years, such stories have been amplified by bot farms and meme accounts, which efficiently churn out misinformation in the form of recognizable visual jokes and catchy slogans. Importantly, memes are extremely hard to moderate, or if you're a member of Gen X, extremely hard to understand. So even when social media platforms attempt to weed out disinformation, images of Obama as a lizard person can skirt by undetected. But while it's easy to blame misinformation on the evolved media landscape, we think there's something more going on. Harson argues that we live in a cultural ambiance of post-truth, defined by a breakdown of social trust. Harson blames the mainstreaming of this public anxiety about truth on the influence and persuasion industries, like PR, marketing, and political communications. He writes that they went from appealing to people's reason to strategically managing their emotions and attention via organized, systematic lying. Such lying is now seen as banal, unremarkable, even expected in commercials or political speech. Harson argues that increasingly, journalism and opinionated commentary use the same emotional appeals of politicians and advertisers. As a result, people tend to measure believability in what makes them feel the most. And outrageous disinformation can make us feel a lot. It's fitting that Alex Jones's reporting style is defined by his pathos frequently expressed in angry and passionate outbursts. In the absence of evidence, the proof lies in his emotional appeal. InfoWars.com, Liberty 11. is rising! You're watching the Liberty Sunday Politics. Rising. We have an idiot freedom on the program today. Stop. You Coming will not up stop in just freedom. 20 minutes. You will not stop the republic. Humanity is awakening. Harson argues that these exaggerated claims made in the pursuit of profit have fundamentally altered our worldviews. He quotes theorist Alison Hearns, who writes, Promotionalism names the extension of market values and commodity relations in all areas of life. In a population so acclimatized to the constant cell, how can we recognize or construct legitimate authority? The link between the language used in advertising and the language used to spread disinformation becomes all the more apparent when we look at the way Alex Jones uses the same platforms to propagate political rumors and to sell dubious products like super male vitality supplements, which I definitely didn't take and which definitely didn't give me a second penis that knew all the words to every Kid Rock song. That's how we fund this revolution against the new world order. In short, our culture is saturated in bullshit, and we're used to being lied to by basically everyone at all times. It's a fun way to live, right? Feeling like we can't trust anything that everyone's lying to us. Um, you can trust me though. Maybe. As Harson argues, American democracy has been, among other things, an evolving competition of fakery. It can be said that people would be irrational not to be highly skeptical of truth claims. And skeptical they are. Gallup polls have found that in 1997, 53% of respondents said they trusted mass media reporting to portray the news fully, accurately, and fairly. By 2021, just 29% of Americans said they have a fair amount of trust for the news. And as journalist Tom Dow writes, when people cease to trust the authorities, they, some of them anyway, become at once more skeptical and more credulous. And fake news is all too ready to slide into the credulous folks' DMs. Thus, it's never been easier to fall for something that isn't true. 
And this played out especially painfully during the 2016 presidential election. A story about the Pope endorsing Trump, for instance, ricocheted across Facebook with nearly a million engagements to bring it before voters' eyes. And disappointed voters found their own solace in a story that got nearly as many engagements post-election. That Ireland would take in American refugees, which you know isn't true because I'm not broadcasting live from Galway Bay. It's why up to 40% of Americans don't believe the results of the last presidential election. And it's why a Pew Research poll in the summer of 2020 found that, largely thanks to traction gained on Twitter and elsewhere online, 71% of Americans had heard the conspiracy theory that COVID was planned by governments, possibly in hopes of injecting citizens with microchips to be tracked on 5G networks, and a third of those people believed the theory. If you're looking for an online community where people won't convince you that you have 5G in your body, you should jump on Wisecrack's Discord, which is a perk you get by joining our Patreon, where not only do you get our Discord server, uh, you get the videos early and without ads, you have access to extra philosophy office hours with me, extra podcast content. Check it out, we got a lot of stuff going on, and I promise we will not try to conspiracy theory you much. So where does all of this leave us? As Stanford scholar Renee DeSestra explains, we are living in an epistemological takedown wherein people think facts don't exist anymore. And that feels like a pretty daunting problem to have. But this isn't the first time humans have grappled with concerns about the extinction of truth. A key question asked by some of the philosophers associated with postmodernism was whether or not truth was still a useful category. Now, this is in contrast to ancient philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, and some more modern idealists like Kant and Hegel, who in their own ways all believed that human reason could arrive at some understanding of universal truths and concepts. But for philosophers like Jacques Derrida and Emmanuel Levinas, who drew inspiration from 19th century thinkers like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, classically metaphysical models of truth sort of flatten the realities of actual human existence and often favor a more theological or hierarchical way of thinking. Now, according to philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard, postmodernism is defined by an incredulity towards meta-narratives. Now, in other words, Postmodernism is a sensibility which is skeptical of metaphysical or scientific modes of thinking, which claim to explain everything in one consistent system, i.e. that all existence is oriented towards one cosmic omnipotent being or concept. Now, Derrida thought that instead of some universal hierarchical truth, meaning has more to do with close readings that reckon with a fundamental difference or undecidability in all texts and situations. For some, this seems like an admittance that truth doesn't exist and everything is ultimately subjective, while for others, this is a position of epistemic humility. Now, for Derrida, this meant that the notions of truth that underlied various colonial political projects were no longer to be taken as universally valid, which to many would be very, very good. But for others, making truth supposedly subjective could have the cultural effect of creating a free-for-all in which all ideas of truth and justice are equally valid. And philosophers like Alain Badiou have noted how this free market approach to truth has been a wonderful gift for capitalism, as it takes traditional categories of truth like art, love, science, and turns them into things that can be more easily marketed, bought, or sold. So art becomes culture. Love becomes sex, science becomes technology. For example, scientific innovation and discovery used to be motivated by a desire to better understand ourselves and the cosmos, but technology became about using science to build fancy gizmos that make stockholders happy. And while love was once about authentic romantic connection, now dating apps and websites call our data while teaching us to reduce the complexity of love and sexuality to a few doctored images on our phones. In mine, I have lots of hair. Things that once gave meaning to our lives now become mere products. For Baju, the reintroduction of truth is necessary to combat this. But rather than the singular truth of Plato or religion, he argues for truths which are relative to specific situations. And these truths are what can give meaning to our lives outside of the free market. Whether that truth is a lover, a commitment to art, a passion for science, or a desire for justice. And in case you're thinking, yeah, but what if my truth is fascism? Bedu argues that the thing that all truths have in common is a principle of equality, so I guess your fascist dreams will have to remain just that. But in the absence of such high-minded ideals, we're left in the truthless ruins that postmodern capitalism has wrought. And that makes it really easy for misinformation to infiltrate the discourse. 
which is one thing if you decide to become a quirky flat earther, but another when you start pizzagating with a side of doxing. But what do you all think? Is our society too fractured to agree upon anything ever again? Or can we regain even a modicum of reverence for truth and objectivity to save ourselves? Let us know in the comments. And if you haven't checked it out yet, please come hang out with us at our new stream, Wisecrack Live. It happens right here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Thanks to our patrons as always. And please, please like this video if you found that it gave you real information. Um, as always, thanks for watching. I'll catch you later.